Horses in a therapeutic riding program often have special needs. Recognizing their special needs is critical to maintaining their long-term program usefulness. Hi, I'm Dr. Kelly Aaron Clayball, an equine veterinarian. And I'm April Johnston, an equine physiotherapist. And we're the co-founders of Equilibrium Institute. Where we help horses by educating their people. The purpose of this seminar is to help you recognize, understand, and manage the unique needs of the therapy horse to enhance their quality of life and usefulness. So first of all, what types of horses end up in a therapeutic riding program? Well, they're often older horses, and they're often lame horses, and we even have old and lame horses. So one challenge is that the therapy horses are often chosen for their job because of their mental aptitude rather than their physical suitability. And as April pointed out, a lot of these horses are older and lame and or lame. These horses are often retired due to injuries that may have precluded them from performing at their previous level. Fortunately, the injury may not necessarily prohibit them from having a valuable second career as a therapy horse. And then there's the other group. These are horses that are often donated for a tax write-off or this broad group we call rescue horses. This presentation is mostly going to deal with the first two categories, the geriatrics and the horses that are serviceably sound for a therapeutic riding program. So let's talk about geriatric horses. Many people seek a win-win situation by retiring their older horses to a program where they will be valued and cared for while the program benefits from getting an experienced, calm horse. However, older horses often have very specific issues that need special management. One of the most common issues that needs management in the geriatric group of horses is dental disease. Another issue is metabolic disease, as well as degenerative joint disease, organ insufficiency, and recurrent airway obstruction, more commonly known as COPD. Older horses often have vision-related issues. The serviceably sound horse, while they may not have some of the age-related issues, often has a lot of different types of body issues, such as degenerative joint disease, soft tissue injuries and diseases that can include desmitis, tendonitis, and back pain, a lot of hoof issues, including bounder navicular, and then also just hoof issues related to a chronic lack of quality care, and neurological issues. But let's back up and talk about the issues specific to the geriatric horse. One of the most common issues is dental disease. So by the time a horse is considered aged, usually its teeth are expiring, which means it's running out of surface area to grind its food. So these horses, as they get older, have less surface area in their teeth or just less teeth in general. And they may have pain associated with chewing, whether from losing their teeth or from having sharp points or hooks in their mouth. They may have pain from uh, TMJ arthritis, where it makes it difficult to have the repetitive motion of chewing. They may have lost musculature in their face as well, which makes it harder to continue a repetitive chewing action. So how would you know if a horse is experiencing dental pain? Well, any of these signs could indicate pain and would warrant a dental exam. Abnormal chewing action with the head tilted or a chomping motion. Quitting or dropping feed, where quitting refers to the cigar-shaped wad of grass or hay that falls out of the horse's mouth. Weight loss. Bridling problems or a head shyness. The horse being unbalanced or one-sided when it's ridden. Facial swellings. Odorous breath unilateral foul-smelling nasal discharge, long stem fibers or undigested oats or corn in the manure, or when severe, impaction colic can indicate dental pain. So knowing that older horses can have significant dental wear, what can you do? Well first, some of the painful issues in the mouth can be corrected. Every horse should have an annual dental exam by a veterinarian and sources of pain and misalignment should be addressed at that time. Some horses may simply not have enough teeth left to adequately chew long stem fiber. These horses should be fed an extruded complete feed that provides fiber, energy, and a balance of vitamins and minerals. Extruded diets are heat processed, so they break down easily even if the horse cannot chew. 
Soaked hay pellets or cubes and beet pulp can also be fed. Small, frequent meals are preferable, as some horses simply get tired of chewing and will leave food uneaten even when they are still hungry. Providing three to four meals per day will allow the horse to consume more calories with less discomfort. Also be sure that the horse has an opportunity to eat his own food. These two horses are the same age and their teeth are in similar condition. While both horses are fed the same diet, the horse on the right is dominant and is consuming most of both rations. Separating horses during mealtime may be necessary. Watch this horse chewing his food. Notice how much falls out as he chews. Feeding a geriatric horse over a rubber stall mat will allow him to more easily clean up the food that spills out, ensuring he is eating all of the food provided. Another thing to consider, especially in climates that have colder winters, is to reduce overall energy expenditure. A lot of older horses really start to fall off in the winter and get in quite poor condition. And one solution is to feed them more, but often, given the things we've discussed, this isn't, um, this doesn't stop the weight loss. In these cases, it's probably more ideal to try to blanket the horse. Another issue that occurs in geriatric horses is metabolic disease. And there's some confusion with horse owners as to the difference between Cushing's and the disease equine metabolic syndrome. But in general, geriatric horses usually are gonna have Cushing's. Um, Cushing's is actually called PPID, but most people refer to it as Cushing's. And it's a disease affecting the pituitary gland in the brain and it dysregulates their hormone production in their body, which results in a whole bunch of different symptoms. But some of the most common ones that people recognize is, unfortunately, laminitis, so pain in the feet, as well as a long, shaggy hair coat that doesn't shed out like it should in the spring. So both of these metabolic diseases um, are, are more common in obese horses, but uh, equine metabolic syndrome, EMS, can occur in much younger horses as well. It's not necessarily a geriatric disease. But so what you want to do is just try and avoid metabolic disease in general, if possible, by maintaining ideal body weight in horse. Don't let them get too fat, okay? We've already talked about how geriatric horses sometimes like to get too thin, but sometimes they end up being really easy keepers and get too fat and they're not in as much work and it just gets even harder to maintain their weight. And this sets them up for some metabolic issues. With Cushing's though, since it is actually not just nutritional in origin, it's related to a pituitary tumor, um, you can't just solve it with diet. So ideally, in order to know if the horse has Cushing's, you need to do blood work to identify it and then treat them with a drug called pergolide to regulate their hormones. Um, aside from doing that, though, ways to make these horses more comfortable is to shave off all the excess hair that they don't shed out like they should. But the biggest one is to keep an eye on these horses for tenderness in their feet. We will discuss laminitis and ways to detect and prevent it in the later section. Another thing to consider with geriatric horses is arthritis, also known as degenerative joint disease. However, because this issue is not isolated only to geriatric horses, we're going to cover this topic in the serviceably sound horse section. The geriatric horse, while it's overall aging, so are its organs. So as the horse is aging, the organs may become less able to do their job. The two most commonly affected organs are the kidneys and the liver. With the kidneys, usually you're going to recognize an increased thirst and more frequent urination. If it's severe enough, these horses sometimes will even lose their appetite and act lethargic. Horses with liver insufficiency have less predictable clinical signs, but if you're in general noticing an older horse that isn't gaining weight like it should despite other methods of increasing its weight, or it's just more lethargic than you think it should be, it's always a good idea to have your veterinarian run some blood work and check for organ function or dysfunction. And pending those findings, your veterinarian would probably make some dietary changes. The owners of this paint gelding were struggling to get him to gain weight despite adequate food and appropriate dental health. Blood work showed that he had liver insufficiency, and changing his diet allowed him to regain his previous good condition.
Another condition common in geriatric horses is recurrent airway obstruction, more commonly known as COPD. COPD causes chronic irritation of the lungs, resulting in inflammation and constriction of the airways. This condition is similar to asthma in humans and results in exercise intolerance and increased respiratory rate. When severe, you'll even notice the horse struggling to push air out of its lungs, evidenced by a heave line on the abdomen. The horse might also have flared nostrils as it's trying to breathe. These horses will also have an unproductive dry cough, especially when worked. This condition is brought on by chronic inflammation brought about by exposure to allergens. Dust, pollens, and molds are the usual culprits. Some horses are more sensitive to allergens found inside the stable, while other horses' symptoms are triggered by outdoor allergens. Indoor allergies can be triggered by dusty shavings, arena footing dust, hay dust, and mold, especially if the ventilation in the barn is not adequate. Methods to reduce dust include using dust-free bedding, watering the indoor arena footing, vacuuming instead of sweeping or blowing the aisle away, not storing hay above the stalls, and watering down the hay or even using hay feeders that can reduce dust. Molds can be more difficult to control, especially in wooden barns and warm humid climates. In these cases, it is best to increase ventilation in the barn or potentially house the horse outdoors. If a horse is sensitive to outdoor allergens such as pollens, it may be necessary to house the horse inside during the times of the year that is most affected. If the management strategies alone do not effectively control the symptoms, medication may be necessary. Anti-inflammatories and or bronchodilators may be required. The last issue affecting geriatric horses that we're going to cover is vision impairment. And usually these horses have cloudiness of the lens and rigidity of the lens that prevents their ability to focus and reduces the amount of light reaching the retina. Other issues that can impact the horse's vision include chronic scarring of the cornea, the outer of the eye, or inflammation of the internal structures of the eye. Oftentimes the first sign that this is occurring is a horse that didn't used to have issues suddenly starts spooking, especially when transitioning from light to dark. While it is often not possible to reverse the changes in an aged horse's eye, it is important to be cognizant of these changes, respecting that the horse may not be able to see as well and therefore may behave less predictably under low light situations. Now that we have covered issues common to geriatric horses, we're going to discuss the most common orthopedic conditions affecting horses in the therapeutic riding programs. The serviceably sound therapy horse can have a host of problems, the most common being arthritis. Arthritis is identified by a stiffness or shortness of stride, reduction in the horse's range of motion, and when severe, limping. Oftentimes, multiple joints are affected although one joint may be more severe than the others. As a caretaker for therapy horses, you should be able to recognize signs of arthritic pain and do your best to manage it. This condition is not reversible, but it can be managed. Knowing the normal range of motion of equine joints will help you identify a horse with reduced range of motion. Don't forget, this also includes the neck and the back, as well as the limbs. For example, when the forelimb is completely flexed, the front hoof should be able to touch the horse's elbow. If not, then one or more joints in the limb likely has arthritis. Horses with hind limb arthritis will often resist picking up their hind feet, or they will lift them away from their body instead of flexing them when asked to pick up their hoof. And while it seems counterintuitive, some will even snatch the leg up and hold it in an exaggerated flexion. If a horse has normal range of motion in the neck, it should be able to bend the neck to the side while maintaining an upright hold. If, however, the horse has neck arthritis, the neck will twist instead of bending, resulting in a tilted pull with the cheek muscle pointing upward. Horses with neck arthritis will often seem stiff or lame in both front feet. These horses are prone to stumbling, especially if their head is pulled 
to one side abruptly. In addition to knowing normal range of motion, you should be familiar with the normal shape and size of the equine joints as abnormal lumps and bumps can often indicate arthritis. Soft tissue degeneration and injuries are also commonly found in the therapeutic horse population. This includes injuries to ligaments, called desmitis, and to the tendons, called tendonitis. Tendonitis is more commonly known as a bowed tendon. The suspensory ligament can be injured acutely in, or can weaken over time, resulting in a dropping of the horse's fetlock joint. This is a painful condition. Additionally, the sacroiliac ligament connecting the pelvis to the spine can also be injured. This condition results in back pain. Horses donated to therapeutic riding programs often have hoof issues. One of the most common hoof ailments horses experience is chronic laminitis, also known as founder. Laminitis is an incredibly painful condition. It typically affects the front feet of horses, causing them to shift their weight backwards onto their hind feet. When walking, the horse moves gingerly with stiff front legs, taking small steps with their weight rockered back on their hind quarters. Their discomfort is much more evident on hard ground. When turning, the horse pivots instead of crossing over with their front feet. This horse is much worse turning to the right than to the left. By the time the horse is donated to the program, the original insult causing the laminitis may be over, but mechanical changes that weaken the hoof capsule have already occurred. These horses have distorted growth rings on the hoof capsule, stretched white lines, flat and or thin soles, and rotation or sinking of the coffin bone. These feet are vulnerable to chronic abscessation. Each horizontal line in the hoof capsule is where an abscess ruptured at the coronary vein and then grew down with the hoof capsule. These horses need soft ground, corrective trimming and or shoeing or boots, nutritional supplementation, and pain management to be serviceably sound. You should be able to recognize signs of a laminitic flare-up and know how to treat it and avoid further flare-ups. Another common reason horses are retired from sport and end up in a therapeutic program is navicular. This condition affects the heel region of the foot, both the navicular bone and the supporting soft tissue structures can be affected. These horses often don't appear lame, but they will take small steps with the front feet. Lameness does become evident if the horse is made to circle on hard ground. Horses with navicular pain will often stand with their weight shifted forward over their front legs. Horses with navicular often have small feet relative to their body mass, with either contracted or underrun heels. When a heel is underrun, more forces are exerted on the navicular region, resulting in bruising and tearing of the underlying structures. While there is a genetic predisposition to navicular, the condition is exacerbated by poor or infrequent farrier care. In fact, many lameness conditions are caused by or are exacerbated by poor hoof care. Recognizing and correcting signs of hoof imbalance, removing flare, and providing the horse with appropriate footing for their condition is essential to maintain the long-term usefulness of the therapeutic horse. Horses may develop neurological deficits due to spinal cord impingement from arthritis or from infectious diseases such as EPM. Horses with mild deficits often can be used in a therapeutic program. Horses with neck or back arthritis, however, can have progression of the condition that results in their becoming unsafe to handle or ride. Stumbling, knuckling over, or swaying in the hind end should be evaluated by a veterinarian and most likely the horse should be retired from the program. So far we have talked about issues specific to the horse, but another significant challenge affecting most therapy horses is a budget constraints that limit management options. A program budget impacts the overall facility the feeding program, and access to TAC professional services and staffing.
Courses require regular access to turnout, which may not be available depending on the geographic area or facility design. Courses that are stalled or pinned for long times can have exacerbated arthritic conditions and or pulmonary issues if ventilation is not adequate. Arena footing can worsen certain lameness conditions if it is too deep or too packed. While it is not always possible to build new paddocks or drag and replace existing footing to accommodate the needs of an individual horse, recognizing these issues allows a caregiver to develop management and care-specific strategies for individual horses. Often, tack is donated, not purchased, specifically for the individual horse. Poorly fitting tack can profoundly impact the comfort and well-being of the therapy horse, particularly with disabled riders who may be unbalanced. Depending on their age and metabolic condition, therapy horses may have special dietary needs. There are many diets and types of forage on the market. Depending on the program budget and local suppliers, the program may not be able to offer each horse the ideal diet for their condition. The program budget affects access to regular veterinary care, barrier services, and alternative modalities such as equine body work. While many of the horses would benefit from more regular professional care, many programs are forced to conserve financial resources for the most basic needs in veterinary emergencies. Budget also directly affects program staffing. Often therapy programs rely heavily on the volunteer workforce. Care quality can be impacted by the lack of continuity in volunteer skill levels and schedules. And this is where Equilibrium Institute aims to help. Knowledge is powerful. Many existing conditions can be ameliorated and crises can be averted when knowledgeable staff is caring for the horses. So far, this presentation has focused on helping you recognize issues that impact the well-being and serviceable soundness of the therapy horse. Now we're going to discuss some of the things your staff should know how to do to help program horses remain serviceably sound and useful. For starters, every volunteer should be able to recognize signs of poor fitting tack. While it may not be possible to get a custom saddle for a back sore horse, there are often simple, inexpensive fixes for saddle imbalance. When evaluating saddle fit, one of the most important and easily fixed issues is front-to-back balance. Imagine there is a ball on the saddle. If balanced, the ball should want to roll towards the middle of the seat. This saddle forces the rider's weight too far back. Folding two quilted wraps and placing them under the rear of the saddle allows the rider to sit in the middle of the seat. Program staff should know how to assess back pain. The best time to do so is before and after saddling as part of the grooming routine. All too often, people test for back pain inappropriately and get a false positive response. Running a sharp object, such as a pen or needle cap, down the back will elicit crouching in most animals, even those without back pain. Sharply poking or prodding an area without having initial contact with the finger on the body will also elicit a false positive. If someone pokes you suddenly with a finger that is not first already contacting your body, it feels much more invasive than if they had gently placed a finger on you and then pressed in. There is an automatic defensive tightening or clenching when poked. To avoid a false positive response, it is necessary to apply pressure in the correct location and in the correct manner. This video will help you assess your own horse's back for tenderness of the overlying musculature as well as the major joints of the spine. There are three major locations to palpate when testing for spinal pain in horses. These locations correspond to the most mobile joints in the horse's back. Digital pressure over the thoracolumbar joint, the lumbosacral joint, and the sacroiliac joints can help determine if spinal pain is present. The thoracolumbar joint lies underneath the cantle of the saddle. The iliopsoas muscle complex, which pulls the entire hip and hind leg forward, originates underneath this joint. Pain in this region can speak to saddle issues or issues in extension of the hind leg. 
The thoracolumbar joint is most easily found by touching the soft part of the upper loin and moving your hand forward until you run into the last rib. Follow the back edge of this rib up to where it intersects with the spine. You won't feel the rib all the way as the head of the rib is buried underneath the long back muscle. Just follow the same line until you intersect with the spine. This is the thoracolumbar joint. Feel the width of the vertebrae. Place your index finger about one inch off the edge of the vertebrae. If you are on the vertebrae, you will get a false positive. Place your other index finger in the same location on the opposite side. Make sure you have your fingers perfectly perpendicular and just touching the horse, but not yet applying pressure, so the horse knows you're there. In a smooth, steady, sinking motion, push straight down with your fingers and count 1001, 1002. If there is pain in this joint, the horse will crouch and flinch. Release the pressure after two seconds. The horse in this first clip does not have back sensitivity. April Johnston is palpating for the last rib and then sliding her fingers towards the spine until she contacts the vertebrae. Then she spreads her fingers out two inches to either side and then presses down with steady, even pressure for two seconds. Yeah. Notice this was the same mare that had crouched and displayed an irritated expression when a pin was used to perform the back test. Using the same technique and pressure, this next mare displays mild sensitivity to thoracolumbar joint palpation. To find the lumbosacral joint, follow the line of upward growing hair just in front of the flank to where it intersects with the back. Be about three inches off either side of the spine as the lumbar vertebrae are quite wide. To test for pain in the lumbosacral joint, you will use the exact same pressure method as for the thoracolumbar joint. So show the hair growing up here. This mare displays extreme sensitivity to lumbosacral joint palpation. Watch as April finds the joint by following the hairs up to the spine, spreading her fingers about three inches apart, and pushing down with steady, even pressure. The mare buckles from her fingers. To test the sacroiliac joint, you must find the tuber cocci of the pelvis. This bony prominence sticks out to the side of the horse's hip region. Curl your fingers around the top of the tuber coxae and sink your fingertips steadily in like you're going to try to pry the bone away. If the horse has pain in the SI joint, he will crouch and buckle. Be sure to test both sides of the pelvis individually. This first horse does not react at all as April presses against the tuber coxae, which puts pressure on the sacroiliac joint. The second mare mildly flinches as April presses against the tuber coxae. All horses, but particularly those with back sensitivity, benefit from range of motion exercises. Just like us humans, stretching is beneficial to prevent stiffness and soft tissue adhesions. Equilibrium Institute has four videos online detailing why and how to properly encourage a horse to stretch. Therapy horses should be encouraged to stretch at least once or twice a week. While we don't have time in this presentation to show all four videos, I recommend you check out Equilibrium Institute's YouTube page and watch each of the carrot stretch videos on your own time. Being able to recognize signs of equine stress is necessary for therapeutic riding program staff. Many program horses are such solid citizens that they hide signs of discomfort. Knowing how to take a horse's TPR, temperature, pulse, and respiration, will help you detect stress, which can be an indicator of underlying pain or indicate a veterinary emergency. Taking the pulse and the limbs is just as important as taking the central pulse. Horses with foot pain, particularly due to laminitis, often have increased digital pulses. 
The digital pulse is a measure of blood pressure in the lower leg of the horse, particularly the hoof. Increased blood pressure within the hoof capsule can cause pain and may be an indicator of trauma or disease of the lower leg. Digital pulses can be elevated due to laminitis, a hoof abscess, sole bruising, or trauma. The pulse you are feeling is blood pressure within the lateral and medial digital arteries. These vessels are located on either side of the fetlock joint. This image details the three locations where the pulse is most readily palpable. When feeling for the vessels, make sure you are not accidentally feeling the branch of the suspensory ligament. To feel the digital pulse, stand in front of and off to the side of the horse. Be sure the horse is restrained appropriately and that you are in a safe position should the horse move forward or paw. Place your index and middle fingers of both hands simultaneously along the sesamoid bones of the fetlock joint. Avoid using your thumb, as sometimes you can mistake your own pulse for the horse's pulse. Hold your fingers in place for 15 seconds. There should be one weak pulse for every one to two seconds. In some horses, it is actually easier to find the pulse slightly above the fetlock or slightly below the fetlock, as demonstrated in this video. It should be difficult to locate the pulse in a normal horse. If you're in the right location and cannot find the pulse, that can be normal. If, however, you feel a throbbing or bounding pulse, then there may be an issue that requires veterinary attention. If there is a strong pulse on one side of the fetlock but not the other, then there likely is an issue with that side of the hoof. Practice taking your own horse's pulse when he is at rest so that you know what his baseline normal pulse feels like. Early detection of problems is often the key to successful treatment. Becoming familiar with each horse's baseline normal pulse will allow you to detect a problem early, hopefully before it becomes severe. Bandaging a leg wound and correctly applying standing wraps is a must-know for any staff member. Standing wraps are used to protect the limbs, restrict mobility, and reduce swelling of the lower limbs. These wraps are often applied to stall-bound horses, especially those with weak circulation. So we're going to start by bandaging her lower leg to try and help push the fluid back up into circulation. These are quilted cotton wraps. Uh, this particular brand is called a Novo because it doesn't bow the tendons in the leg. So how you want to wrap it is you follow the direction of the tendons. So on the left front, you're going to wrap from outside in, so counterclockwise. On the right side of the body, you would wrap the opposite direction, you'd be wrapping um, clockwise. So I start with the wrap on the inside point of her leg, and you're wrapping from knee to about mid pastern. I'm laying it nice and smooth, and I'm pulling it just tight enough that it lays flat. And think of it like wearing your socks. You don't want them all bunched up inside your shoe because it's uncomfortable. So the wrap's on nice and smooth. Then I use this, which is called nylon track wrap. You can either start over the top, or some people will tuck the wrap in to help kind of hold it in place. And this is where it requires a little bit of dexterity and practice makes perfect. Sometimes you'll end up dropping the wrap if you're not that familiar with how to do it. So, but you start from the middle and wrap down the leg first. And the goal is your wrap should cover half the previous wrap. So I'm going 50%. And I'm pulling it pretty snug. Okay. You have to be careful that you don't bow a tendon in a horse's leg by pulling things too tight. But as long as you have a squishy cotton wrap underneath this non-stretchy wrap, you're not going, it's, it's not very easy to get it too tight. So now I'm, I went down below the pastern for a little bit of support. And I'm coming back up the leg covering my wrap about 50% each time. That figure somewhat depends on the length of your horse's cannon bone. So 
wrap all the way up to the top. You don't want the wrap going over because then it'll curl in and rub on the hairline. So you want the wrap, a little bit of your, your cotton wrap to stick out at the top and the bottom. And just making sure it's nice and smooth and even the whole time. By the time we've finished this bandage, the combination of the cotton wrap and the nylon track wrap is called a standing wrap because we use these wraps on horses that are standing around and tend to get swelling in the lower leg. We aren't expecting you to learn everything in one 45 minute lecture, but we are hoping you'll be stimulated to learn how you can better serve the service horse. To round out what you've learned today, Equilibrium Institute offers online courses and hands-on workshops for all budgets and schedules. For PATH professionals and volunteers, we recommend the following courses. The First Aid Course and Workshop, Body Work for PATH Professionals, Any of the Race-Approved Veterinary Technology Courses, Phototherapy, Equine Nutrition, and the equine hoof. For more information about Equilibrium Institute, check us out at www.equi-libriuminstitute.com, where we help horses by educating their people.